Hello and welcome to Hydrothermal Features. We're going to be learning about all of the things that you see in this image right here. So I'm just going to get right into it. So you can be one of those people who's been lucky enough to see all four of them. You find hydrothermal features in areas that have the right things that make them work, geologically speaking, that is. You need an access point that has a heat source, which is typically a mantle plume. Having said that, sometimes you get hot springs that have nothing to do with magma plumes. For example, you might have some rocks that have some radioactive decay in them. This is actually fairly normal. And they give off heat and they can be close to the surface. That can create something like a hot spring. But to get something that does all of these features from left to right, you see a geyser, then you see a mud pot, a fumarole, and on the right you see a hot spring, very specific requirements must occur. So any kind of hydrothermal features will form along the right places, such as divergent and convergent plate boundaries. But the highest concentration of geysers in the world exist far away from any plate boundary in the middle of the North American plate, and that would be Yellowstone National Park. So I'm not telling you they can't form elsewhere, because they do, and I've seen them around the world. But there is a rhyme and a reason, again, for how and where they form. So let's talk about geysers and just dive right into this, because I want you to be one of the few lucky people in the world that's actually seen a geyser eruption. So by the time you finish this lecture in the corresponding lab, I am certain you will understand and know the different types of geysers and the requirements that are needed to make them work. The first requirement is a geyser must have a constriction inside of its plumbing. So in order for a geyser to work, I'm just holding up a bottle of glass cleaner for my eyeglasses. You need a constriction. So I'm going to open this up and I'm going to say, Let's just say this is the interior of a geyser right here. And this is the constricting point. That constricting point doesn't happen by accident because what will occur is you get some kind of heat source inside the earth and it's causing this water, groundwater specifically, to turn into steam. And it has that steam comes through that constriction point and then returns back into some type of liquid at the surface by doing that, by creating an eruption. How does that happen? The constriction must occur because of some type of buildup of geologic material inside of that plumbing, again, what I was showing you. So that plumbing's the inside of, for example, like the plumbing in your house. So where does that come from? Primarily, we find these constrictions from high silica deposits called geyserite. Geyserite also has another name called center, S-I-N-T-E-R. But geyserite is simply high silica deposits that are actually precipitated out during that eruption that I was talking about that causes the buildup of that silica. So basically it's constricting the inside of the plumbing. So again, you need a heat source, you need the unique plumbing, and then you must have the water source to make a geyser work. Without those three things, or just two of them, you won't get a geyser. You could get a different type of feature. For example, you have the water, but not the constriction, and you got the heat. Then that could produce something like a hot spring. You get the water and the heat, no constriction. You might get a mud pot. You get virtually no water, then you get the heat, you're going to get something like a fumarole. So look at these pictures here. I took these shots in Iceland. And the reason that this particular set of pictures is highly significant to this lecture is the fact that all geysers are named after this specific place and this specific geyser called geyser. <laughs> and one of the things I might point out is the geology material is very high in silica. So you'll learn more about this as we get into volcanoes in our next section and chapter. 
You already learned about them in igneous rocks, so we're looking at high silica intermediate rocks and certainly felsic rocks that can do this. So this is actually a pool type of geyser, pool slash fountain geyser, and you because you don't see any kind of cone structure right in here. But this is what geyser looks like before it erupts. When you get that eruption, do you see how it's throwing up water into the air? That is one way that a geyser differs from a hot spring because we don't see those types of eruptions in a hot spring. Now surely a hot spring could turn into a geyser at some point, right? If you get the constriction, that third requirement that's so important for a geyser, but most don't. And so geysers are very, very rare. This is a good look at how a geyser works. You need an active heat source, abundant water, and then you need unique plumbing, which are the fractures in the rock, and specifically the rhyolitic plumbing that makes it work. Uh, these elements all put together uh, allow for the eruption process to occur. So where do we get the geyser locations around the world? It's no surprise that we find them along major plate boundaries, specifically where heat is involved. So you don't really see heat associated with most transformed plate boundaries, but you certainly do with divergent and convergent plate boundaries. For example, the ones I showed you just a second ago in Iceland are along a divergent plate boundary. I've been to and seen a number of them in New Zealand, and I can tell you that the ones in New Zealand are from a convergent plate boundary, a subduction zone. But where I circled in red, right here, Yellowstone, this little dot right here, that hot spot is nowhere near a plate boundary, but yet it has the highest concentration of geysers in the world. So that is important for you to know that all geysers have to be associated with some type of a hot spot. So it's not just at convergent and divergent plate boundaries. In fact, again, the highest concentration are found inside of a plate, intraplate. You'll learn more about that in earthquakes, but we find them nowhere near some type of major plate boundary. So it's strictly hot spot business. So when we get geysers at hot spots and they form in the interior of continents, no plate boundary did make them. So that means a hot spot is cooking continental crust. And if you go back to earlier in the semester, you learn that continental crust is primarily granitic or granite based. So granite is the felsic intrusive plutonic igneous rock. Its extrusive equivalent is rhyolite. So many of the geysers that we find inside of a continent like Yellowstone are made out of stuff called rhyolite. And that's the high silica material that's responsible for making the geyserite. That is the unique plumbing or constriction inside a geyser. So let's get back to those three requirements again. These are so important. <laughs> you must have an abundant groundwater supply. That's first and foremost. Number two, that adequate heat source. So that's the hot spot. And three, the unique plumbing constriction or system that is caused by geyserite. When those three things are in place, you can create this remarkable situation of a geyser. So this is a diagram that is found in Yellowstone National Park at the park headquarters at the Upper Geyser Basin. That geyser basin is significant because that's where Old Faithful is. That is one of the most recognizable and famous geysers in the world. <laughs> and so you can see this real plentiful water supply known as a groundwater supply. Then do you see how you get this construction right here in this area where I'm moving my mouse? That causes the groundwater to turn to steam because it has to force through pressure up towards the surface. Then it turns back into water as it uh, goes through that process of being forced to the surface and turns back into a geyser eruption. So when you see hot springs, hot springs are missing this one component, which is that constriction or unique plumbing. Steam vents are really missing most of the water supply. And so they come up and they make a lot of steam, but they're missing a really, really, really good water supply. 
So we're going to look at each one of these hydrothermal features and talk about why they're so unique and important. Let's start by learning about the two groups of geysers. There's cone geysers and fountain slash pool geysers. So fountain and pool are interchangeable terms, but I want you to see how they differ. So this is a cone geyser. It's actually called Lady Knox Geyser, and it's no located on the North Island of New Zealand. And I took this shot during one of their eruptions. The irony is this is actually a man-made structure, or it started off that way. The prisoners that used to be held near Rotorua in New Zealand figured out that the soap that they were given would foam up if they put it in the presence of this heated water that existed there. So over time, the phosphorus built up and the materials and the soap creating this cone feature. Now it is literally a cone geyser. So it's made the geyserite material that we are looking for in regular geysers. But do you see the cone right here? And can you see the water shooting straight up? So let's compare that to geyser over here in Iceland. Do you see how it's that big area that's just throwing up water and it's not coming from a cone? So let me be clear that a fountain geyser over time could certainly turn into a cone geyser if you had enough eruptions and could develop a cone with enough geyserite that deposited into that shape. So we're going to take a look at how they work. Let's start with cone geysers. They have a distinctive cone shape that comes from geyserite. You've heard me use that word over and over thus far. So you're actually looking at white cone geyser here, and I want you to see that this is a very large structure. So when it erupts, water is going to come shooting straight up like this. That is one distinctive difference from a fountain slash pool geyser. But in either case, you're going to get the development of geyserite inside the plumbing of the geyser for that to work. But in the case of cone geysers, you get it in a second place at the surface. And that makes these unique features right here, which are cone geysers. But when you look at these two geysers, both from Yellowstone, I want you to compare their size. The larger the cone, the older the cone, and likely the more frequent the eruption has occurred. So this is Castle Geyser on the left, definitely a large cone, indicating it has been erupting probably for much longer, depositing more geyserite, likely erupting more frequently. Then you get the small little cone for Pink Geyser. Now they're both functional geysers, but little pink guys are over here, not so big, right? <laughs> and so when you're looking at this, I want you to think about what geysers do and how cone geysers differ from the next type I'm going to show you in a minute, which are fountain slash pool geysers. So again, older geysers have bigger cones. So this is a cone geyser in Yellowstone National Park having sporadic eruptions. As we are on site, you can see that it is releasing geothermal energy, which is very common for any hydrothermal feature. But notice the size of the cone would indicate that this is an older cone or one that's received more frequent eruptions. So let's get to the fountain slash pool geysers. So this is a uh, fountain slash pool geyser in Yellowstone and what happens is you get almost like a regular fountain at a college or at a memorial or even if you're thinking about a swimming pool and if you're in a swimming pool you know at the bottom there's the drains and there's also where water can be funneled up into it as it's filling up you have to imagine that where the drain is at the bottom of a pool is the opening for this fountain slash pool geyser and it that pressure is building up coming through that constriction because of geyserite and then it's going to erupt up at the surface and it's going to spray so this one's beginning its eruption if it had a full-fledged eruption it would look like the one i showed you in iceland going in all directions instead of coming straight up from a cone now i also want to point out do you see how the water is running on the surface here that's super common and regardless of what kind of geyser you have, oh, 
And especially with fountain slash pool geysers, they're spraying in a more 360 degree fashion as compared to uh, cone geysers that kind of shoot straight up. So you tend to get a lot of water runoff. You're looking at this particular uh, fountain slash pool geyser in Yellowstone and you can begin to see as it's heating up and starting not just to boil, the boiling is just could be a hot spring, right? But this one's beginning its eruption process and pushing water up towards the surface and it will spray from inside where that pressure built up where the geyserite exists. This is Great Fountain Geyser in Yellowstone and it's just a big wet area, right? So there's no cone, no geyserite buildup at the surface, but I'm beginning to see some deposits that are getting made here. So you might go, well, where is the geyserite coming from? Well, that's the magic behind Yellowstone. And we'll get to that at the end of the lecture. But this geyser is going to erupt. And when it does, it's going to spray. And it's going to produce a large amount of water. You can see that it has because there's water on the surface. It could also have some hot springs coming to the surface. But this is likely the origin right here of where that fountain geyser will erupt. You are seeing a fountain geyser erupting in Yellowstone National Park. Notice that there is no cone structure from which the fountain is erupting. This is why it's considered a fountain slash pool geyser. Let's talk about how hot springs differ from geysers. This is the most recognizable hot springs in Yellowstone National Park. It's called the Grand Prismatic Springs. It's in the upper geyser basin on the same basic boardwalk as Old Faithful. So if you're going to see Old Faithful, you should go walk over here because it's worth going to see this really colorful thing. And I'll explain in a little bit why it's so colorful. Hot springs do not have that unique plumbing system. So they only have two of three requirements that make a geyser. They have the heat and the, the groundwater. They're missing the unique plumbing system, which is the geyserite inside of this right here, the plumbing beneath the Earth's surface. So if indeed it did create that, this could actually turn into a fountain geyser, right? And then over time, maybe even a cone geyser. But hot springs do not throw up water in the air, but they can certainly boil. And some of them are so acidic that they could literally burn your skin off, not just from heat, but from acid. So you need to be very careful. Make sure that if you're taking a dip in hot springs that aren't protected like these in Yellowstone, maybe they're in a, a place out in the wilderness, just be smart about testing that water some way to find out if it's highly acidic and how hot it is. Because you need to be careful that people just trust that all hot springs are safe and they're not all safe for humans to get into. This is a hot springs in Yellowstone National Park and I want you to notice how clear the water is and I want to point out depth here too. You really can't see it in a good three-dimensional way unless you got up to this area and got up on it, but it would be tens of feet deep. And some, some of these are 60, 70 feet deep. And you get there and you realize that there's no unique plumbing system for these hot springs to operate. But certainly, they have enough water that they can spill out and create runoff like I was showing you with that fountain geyser. We're at Emerald Springs at Norris Geyser Basin. And while it is extremely steamy this morning, this is a very, very crystal blue colored spring. And the only other color you're going to see is yellow. The reason that it's blue is all the other colors of light are absorbed and the blue is the only one reflected back. Uh, the yellow comes from sulfur deposits and it stinks. Uh, we're standing right here right now. It's the only thing you can't get the gist of with this picture. But this is only 27 feet deep. People often ask me how deep are these things. It depends. Some of them are deeper than 27 feet. But that's a nice fall if you were to come into one of these hot springs. So more to come. We'll see you on the next stop. Bye. So what's a fumarole? You may know it as a steam vent. But its real name is a fumarole. So a fumarole is a hydrothermal feature that lacks a unique plumbing system 
and it lacks a water supply. Now there's some form of water that's creating the steam, but just not enough that it could create some type of geyser system. If it did get water and ample amounts of it, it likely would be a geyser. One of the really common things that are associated with most fumaroles is an odor. A stinky odor, I might add. It's a uh, rotten egg odor, and that comes from sulfur dioxide. And this is a picture from Yellowstone right here, and you can see from the National Park Service how yellow that is. Sulfur is a yellow mineral most of the time. And then you can see another steam vent right here. Not all are yellow, but many do uh, have deposits of sulfur around them, meaning the sulfur itself has deposited as a mineral deposit around the fumarole. It is totally unsafe to stick your face in front of one of these. And you might go, well, that seems like a dumb idea. You'd be surprised what people do. Curiosity gets the best of many humans. <laughs> Don't stick your face in front of one of these because you do not know how hot it is. And if, if sulfur dioxide has actually turned into sulfuric acid, you can get the gist of what could happen. I mean, be careful around fumaroles. They can be very dangerous. Just about every place that has any kind of hydrothermal activity will produce a fumarole. They're very common, just like hot springs. And by the way, hot springs are the most common thermal feature out there. Here's a fumarole uh, that is in Yellowstone, and you can see here's that opening right here and the steam's coming out. At this very site, I saw somebody get off the boardwalk and go walk and get in front of this thing and stick their face there. First of all, it's illegal to get off the boardwalk. That could be a very expensive trip to Yellowstone. And there's some good reasons for that. Fumaroles can compromise the integrity of the substrate, making it very weak. So you could easily step on that and exceed the angle of repose, which you learned about in mass wasting, and this whole thing could collapse. Then you would be in potentially a very, very boiling hot water situation. And in some places, it could also be acidic. So do not get off the boardwalk. Like I said, it is illegal and it is definitely a way not to spend the money you planned on a vacation by getting a big fat ticket and maybe even a trip to jail. Welcome to Yellowstone National Park. We are just south of Norris Geyser Basin, a very important geyser basin. We'll talk about that later. But we couldn't help but notice this thermal feature. And there's actually several things going on. There is a fumarole in the background. That's that hissing noise you're hearing. That is where a hot spring boils off its water. It's extremely hot, by the way, and it's stinky. It smells like sulfur or rotten eggs. Um, so the other features that you have here, right by the fumarole in the back, is actually a geyser. I can see that erupting, and I see quite a bit of geyserite from this angle. And then you've got what definitely would qualify as hot spring, but I'm going to say it may even be geyser because I see geyserite around the act, uh, outside. And there are more geysers in this park than anywhere else in the world that are active. It has to do with the plumbing. So we'll be talking more about that. The plumbing comes from rhyolitic material that was actually laid down over the last couple of million years from several different volcanic eruptions. So more to come from Yellowstone. See you at the next stop. Bye. Now my personal favorite are mud pots. I love mud pots. I think they're just super cool. So let's talk about what they are. When you get fumaroles that form under a water source, they really cook up that water and they saturate the sediments. And remember, there's sulfur dioxide, which can turn into sulfuric acid. So that eats away the fabric of that rock material, compromising it, and then turning it into mud. The thickness of the mud matters because it is determination of two things. One, how much silica is present. Number two, how much water is present. So you're seeing uh, these two Yellowstone examples here, but notice how fluidy this looks and then how thick this looks. And both are mud pots, but 
neither one of them is safe. <laughs> so out of all of the thermal features, I would be the most concerned about people getting in contact with mud pots because we already know it's made of acid. Certainly a fumarole is hot enough that it could burn you, but there's not 100% sure it's always going to be acidic. But you can guarantee mud pots are going to be a problem. So never get near a mud pot. These are some mud pots at Mammoth Hot Springs in Yellowstone. And you can see how it's compromising and growing. This mud pot's growing. Do you see how it's causing fractures and cracks and mass wasting that's occurring here? So this whole thing could continue to grow and get bigger and bigger. So this is problematic. Let's say you had a house built near mud pots. And this is the kind of soil problems that you could have, you could see how that could run a foundation. There are very few people who would build a house next to a mud pot. Just saying, though, that you should be careful about walking or being in the vicinity of mud pots. Those alerts should be going up of being, I should be extra careful in this area. All right, we are at Yellowstone National Park on the west side of the park, approaching Norris Geyser Basin to a very, very special place that's about a third of a mile hike off the road called Artist Paint Pots. It's a really beautiful place. <clears throat> During the day, uh, in the summer, it's extremely busy. So if I were you, I'd come out here early in the morning. But one of the things that makes it challenging to see stuff in the morning is the extra steam that comes from these geothermal features like you're seeing back here. These are mud pots. They are my absolute favorite thermal feature. I think you can see why, they're really neat. The popping noise is not uh, anything I'm fabricating, that is nature at work. And what happens is acidity from the uh, magma chamber that changes the chemistry of the groundwater comes up through the sediments and soils, in this case volcanic ash, and kind of eats it away and makes a fabric a very soupy, acidic material. So this would be one of the most unsafe places to be in the park or try to walk on this ground because it's like sulfuric acid, very much like it. So sometimes they're very viscous, the one that's right next to us that's making all that plopping noise. It's very thick. In this case right over here, the mud's pretty viscous, so there's a better groundwater source here. But you can notice that the integrity of the sediments around there is starting to mud crack. Well, they'll dissolve over time and add to the soupy mixture here and make the mud pot bigger. So these are mud pots. Uh, they are very common types of thermal features, uh, but special. So when you see one, keep your distance, but go check them out. See you at the next stop. This is a fumarole at Sulphur Caldron, and um, I might add it's in the parking lot. So what's happened is it's so uh, acidic that it's eaten through the asphalt, and they've had to block it off and make a, a barricade for it. Let me show you what I'm talking about here. And these uh, should appear, it's kind of like karsting and limestone, except imagine it was done with sulfuric acid. So this is not something you would want to get your face near or breathe for any length of time because of the acidity and the nature of the gas itself. You can even see the yellow deposits. That's an indicator of sulfur. All right. So let's go back to Grand Prismatic Springs, which is uh, right here. This is what you're seeing. Look at the vibrant colors. That's not magic. That, are, that is caused by thermophiles. So let's break down thermophiles. Thermo heat files refers to the bacteria. So heat loving bacteria. Now, in your book, I talk about the various different types of heat colors. And each color has a range of heat that the bacteria thrive in. So once you get out of that heat range, it can turn into different bacteria mats. You can see some that grow in tandem together because there are areas where you get crossover and meaning one range can leak into another range in terms of transitioning. So you can get this array of gorgeous colors from black to white to yellows to oranges to browns and greens. And each one represents a unique heat signature that these particular species and groups of bacteria can thrive in. So the colors really do mean something. The hottest temperatures produce the most vibrant colors. 
And so as you look at this and you see these various different thermophiles that I've taken photos of, they all represent living organisms. So let's think about this. Let's say all of a sudden Yellowstone loses its groundwater resource because of climate change. Or we get a mega drought and there's nothing to recharge the groundwater system. In a couple of sections, chapters down the line, you'll learn about groundwater and why this is so important. Then these guys aren't going to be able to live anymore. The thermophiles will not be able to survive because they must have that heat and water to survive. You can actually see this really well in the northernmost part of Yellowstone and Mammoth Hot Springs, where the hot springs may not flow all the time in certain areas of that part of the park, but in, they do, you can see the colors of thermophiles, and when they don't have water flowing, then you can see it just looks like plain Jane travertine, which is just whitish in color. Which brings me to travertine terraces. <laughs> That's a feature that you will see in places that, uh, such as Yellowstone National Park, I might add. You can also see them in some caverns. So majority of the rock in Yellowstone is not what makes travertine. In fact, a majority of the rock material is rhyolite, which is igneous. In order to make a travertine terrace, you must have had limestone, which is sedimentary. It's a carbonate-based rock that has been re-precipitated and turned into travertine. And that's what this is at Mammoth Hot Springs. So you can see people walking on the boardwalks. These are the Mammoth Hot Springs terraces. And remember me saying the colors matter? Well, these are some examples of thermophiles. So when the water is not flowing, you'll get this pure white color right here because the thermophiles can't exist and they will die off. So that as soon as that water source comes back up and it's hot again and hot enough for the right types of the various colors that make those different colored thermophile bacteria mats, then you'll start to get color again. This kind of gives you a shot of what it looks like uh, for Mammoth Hot Springs for the travertine terraces. So let me reiterate that Mammoth Hot Springs does not have rhyolite. That is why there are no geysers there. It's a no geyser zone. Instead, you have other types of thermal features uh, such as hot springs. They're everywhere. Sometimes you could see a fumarole and you can certainly even see some mud pots up that way. But what happens is for hot springs to form travertine terraces, the water dissolves the calcium carbonate in that limestone and it uh, deposits the calcite on top of that limestone to make a new deposit or new rock called travertine, which is just re-precipitated limestone. Again, geysers don't exist in the most northern part of Yellowstone National Park because the geology is not right for geysers to exist there. But you do have the right circumstances to form hot springs, which is a water source and an ample heat source. You got both of those requirements. This is Mammoth Hot Springs, which is a no geyser zone. It is outside of the Yellowstone Caldera region that has a tremendous amount of rhyolite. Instead, it's made of limestone marine rock that has been re-precipitated, known as travertine, and it produces these hot springs. And the colors come from thermophiles, which are heat-loving bacteria, and each color represents a different temperature. So when there is not flowing water, the color is the white that you see here. This is Orange Mound, and uh, so when you look at Orange Mound, this is in Mammoth Hot Springs. Notice the colors, and again, the colors come from thermophiles. This is re-precipitated limestone that it forms a unique rock called travertine. I think that's important enough for you to know that travertine is what makes up the Mammoth Hot Springs area of Yellowstone. Just to re-emphasize, the geology type matters. So on the left, you see the upper geyser basin of Yellowstone, which is very rich in high silica rhyolitic rock deposits. In fact, it's made from a mega colossal eruption 
about 640,000 years ago. And you'll learn a little bit about that in this chapter and in our next uh, chapter section that we talk about the different types of eruptions. But the felsic material is super high in silica, and that facilitates the formation of that geyserite, which creates the right mechanism for unique plumbing, which is why we get geysers there. You come over to the right where Mammoth Hot Springs is, those travertine terraces, they're not rich in silica. They're rich in calcium carbonate. So you can't form geysers there, but you can form other thermal features, such as hot springs. So the highest concentrations of the world's geysers exist in North America and the portion of the plate, in the middle of the plate, actually, and the state of Wyoming, and that's Yellowstone National Park. So we're going to go there and show you a little bit of how it works. There are numerous geyser basins. As you can see, if you come in, most people from where we are, if you're assuming that you're from Texas or somewhere in the south, you would come from this area likely. And you would come in and I would encourage you just to drive a little further to go see West Thumb. It has a really cool geyser basin that's on a lake. So you get to see some cone geysers that are beneath water and they're called fishing cones. Great geyser basin. If you go to towards the east area, there's some great wildlife in this section right here. And if you kind of make your bend, I'll also tell you there's good wildlife in this section too. If you make the bend and start heading up this direction, you need to go see Mud Volcano and Sulphur Caldron. This is where you're going to see a lot of mud pots and some really interesting thermal features. Come over to this side, you can see there's Lone Star, Basin, Upper Geyser Basin, Midway, Lower, and then Norris. We're going to take a look at the Upper Geyser Basin and Norris Geyser Basin. Why am I not showing you all of them? Because these two have the most geysers in the world and also the most famous geysers in the world. They were also, we've already kind of looked at Mammoth Hot Springs, but notice it's way up here. Most people don't make it that far north. So you're out of the boundaries of where the Yellowstone caldera exists when you're in Mammoth Hot Springs. In fact, you are really more in the area where there's limestone and that's been re-precipitated into travertine, which is why we don't get geysers there. When you get to the upper geyser basin, the first thing you're going to notice is there's just numerous dozens and dozens of geysers. That's so unusual because there's literally about a thousand-ish active geysers around the world and you, you can see dozens of them here, dozens and dozens. <laughs> and some are very routine, meaning they're predictable, some are not. And in this geyser basin, there happens to be the most dependable one at this time in terms of predictability, which is Old Faithful. But looking at this, can you see all the fumarole and the thermal activity going on out there, that's a clue that we've got a geologically active region. So when we're learning about each of these unique features that are specific to a geyser basin, here's the things I want you to know. Is it a fountain slash pool geyser or is it a cone geyser? Is it predictable or non-predictable geyser? And three, is it located in the upper geyser basin or the Norris geyser basin? You might go, that sounds like a lot of information. It's really not. One reason I want you to know that is the differences between the basins matter because you get unique features in both places and a lot has to do with slightly different groundwater characteristics and that changes how everything works. So as we start our features now, we'll start with just a hot spring, crusted pool. This is a hot spring and unfortunately it's a tragic situation where somebody has gotten off the boardwalk and fallen into this and has perished. So that's one reason it's illegal to get off the boardwalks, but it's a beautiful thing to look at. And I can tell you the last time I was there, there was a family that was wanting to take their Christmas picture in front of this or a family photo. And they had multiple kids, and they also had an unauthorized pet with them. The pet kind of got loose, spotted this, tried to run away. And when the kids go, Mommy, look, it looks like a, our pool, and started running off the boardwalk. I grabbed the kid in midair, 
the dog turned around. And by then, the park rangers were booking it to Crested Pool. I happened to have been videoing for a virtual field trip that you'll learn about when this happened. And that kid would have taken a nosedive into Crested Pool. They would have also been another loss of life. So we have to take these thermal features very seriously. So let's look at one of the most impressive geysers in the Upper Geyser Basin. In my opinion, it's more impressive than Old Faithful. But you've got to go see Old Faithful if you're there. You just have to. The reason I love Grand Geyser is because it's bigger. It just doesn't erupt as frequently. It's a fountain geyser where Old Faithful is a cone geyser. This one erupts about every 8 to 12 hours. And it's right in front of Old Faithful Inn. But the duration of it matters. The duration can be 10 or more minutes. So this makes a really spectacular eruption and people kind of hang out on the patio in front of Old Faithful Inn waiting for this thing to go off. And the park rangers kind of can alert you to when they're going to go off. There's even announcements over loudspeakers for things like Old Faithful Geysers and even Grand Geyser, uh, you can get the same kind of thing. They're not very far apart at all. Daisy Geyser, this is a cone geyser, very predictable, erupts about every 120 to 200 minutes. And because of that, the cone is shooting it up. It's not a very big cone, you can see it right down here. Very predictable, upper geyser basin. So we got to look at the most predictable of them, at least what we call the most predictable in terms of its name, Old Faithful Geyser. But notice this big cone right here, <laughs> right there. So we were there taking, when we took this shot, and, you know, people are walking up to the geyser. You can't really get off the boardwalk here. But I can tell you if you're there in front of thousands of people because this is right out of the parking lot where literally bus loads and I'm not exaggerating there bus loads of tourists come in and they gather around to see Old Faithful go off but it's a it is very predictable so let's talk about why it's so predictable it has a really ample groundwater supply in fact there are two reservoirs right here this is some of the signage from the Old Faithful area and the park uh, ranger stations right back here. And when you look at this thing erupt, these things don't last very long for Old Faithful, three to five minutes as uh, on average, I would say about three to four minutes is average. But it's pretty spectacular when it goes off. And I will tell you my favorite eruptions I've seen of Old Faithful have been at night. There are very few people there so you can get a front row seat park yourself on the benches, and man, it just is, it's unbelievable to see this thing go off. But it's definitely a cone geyser, not a fountain geyser. So showing you some phases, you can see the steam phase, and it's increasing, it steams 24-7, by the way. And then you can see the water coming out, and then this, the water's going back down into the reservoir, that water which did not run off, has surface water runoff, and then it starts phase one again and continues to steam. So the closer you get to that eruption time, the more the steam increases. We're looking now at the most predictable geyser in Yellowstone, which is Old Faithful. She is also a cone geyser. She is in the upper geyser basin, unlike Steamboat Geyser, which was in the Norris Geyser Basin. Each one has its own personality. So when this thing goes off, it goes off every 90 to 120 minutes. Been doing that faithfully where she gets her name for centuries. This is what Old Faithful looks like as you're looking down from some of the other trails. This is the Old Faithful Inn. They're about, oh, I don't know, seven or eight different places to stay out there. And then there's the park uh, headquarters that's located at, in the area. But this is a good shot of seeing how the surface water runoff comes off after every one of these eruptions around its sequence, meaning every 90-ish minutes. And as you look at that going off, it is spectacular. Wow, right? It is. This is the Old Faithful Inn, and I need to tell you a little history here because this is the first of its type. National parks needed to start building lodging, and so they used materials from the local area and built a lodge. And lodges today at most all parks follow the same format and the same kind of body plan. 
And so the Old Faithful Inn, the original one, this is where you would kind of hang out and, you know, get a beverage and a meal and hang out and wait for Grand Geyser to go off right in front of the porch there. It's really a spectacular place. So this is Twin Geysers in Upper Geyser Basin. And the reason I'm showing you some other geysers are simply just to give you perspective. There are literally dozens and dozens of these geysers to look at, not just Old Faithful. Twin geysers are side by side. They're each cone geysers, and you're going to wonder, are they predictable or non-predictable? So I'm going to ask you, do you see what looks to be geyserite and a lot of it? And if you see that, that's a good indicator they're probably pretty predictable. In the upper geyser basin, you can see this place. It's an unnamed pool geyser. It's just forming. But can you see the geyserite material on the outside, the crusty material? That is a good clue. And that tells you that it's been erupting. In the upper geyser basin, you can see a couple of other types of geysers. This is round geyser on the left, which is a cone geyser, and then tiny little geyser over here. So we get big ones like round geysers and tiny ones like tiny geysers. I don't need you to learn the details of these are predictable or not predictable. The point is its perspective of learning about various different thermal features. This one right here is a, a pool fountain geyser. And this is anemone geyser, so it looks like a sea anemone. You can see how there's not a definitive cone yet, but it's certainly beginning to make enough geyserite deposits that it could become one. This is beehive. Beehive is very predictable, and you can guess, yes, it's a cone geyser. So I actually saw someone get off the boardwalk about an hour after I saw the people at Crested Pool get in trouble the last time I was there. And these people, they uh, had a really unfortunate trip because I saw them later that day. They actually made a trip to jail because the guy actually ran out to get a video shot of this going off. And we're all screaming and hollering. The park rangers are on the loudspeakers telling him to run and get off. And uh, boy, if they they weren't there in a minute. I mean, that was quite a distance from the park headquarters. They, they really moved fast to get there. But it's illegal to get off the boardwalk. So don't do it when you're in these areas. Even in a foreign country, most of them have boardwalks for a reason because the ground is compromised. And you're like, well, wild animals walk on it. They're fine. I should be too. The animals already know. I mean, they've, they've been on it enough to know where weak spots are, and then sometimes they fall in too. Here, this is air spring, and this is exactly what it is. It's a hot spring, but it's in the shape of an ear, so that's where it gets its name, ear spring. It doesn't have that unique plumbing, so it can't be a predictable geyser because it's not even a geyser. If you get to the back part of the Upper Geyser Basin, you'll get to an area called Solitary Geyser. And I've, not, I've been there in times where it's hard to get to this area. Maybe the boardwalk's been compromised, but I'm telling you it's worth the hike if you can get out there to see Solitary Geyser. As you guessed, it is a pool geyser. There's no definitive cone, but it's really a beautiful place to see. As you're making the travel from the Upper Geyser Basin, Upwards, you'll probably want to go to Norris Geyser Basin. Not to sound like I like Norris Geyser Basin better than the Upper Geyser Basin, but I do. Having said that, the Upper Geyser Basin is spectacular. It's, it, it's a must-go-see. You have to visit the Upper Geyser Basin if you're going. But Norris Geyser Basin, wow! More thermal features and geysers than any place I've ever been to on the planet. When you get there, there are two different sides to it. There's the back basin, which is a longer hike, and then there's the porcelain basin. But there's a lot to see in both parts of this. But it has the most acidic thermal features in the park as a cluster. Now, there's one area that totally is the most acidic feature in the park, and that's sulfur caldron. It's totally on the other side of the park. But in terms of geysers, this has the most acidic geysers in the park system. And most of them have a pH of three to four. That is extremely low. So when you're looking at this, that's why it's so imperative to stay on the boardwalk. I've been to different parts of Norris Geyser Basin. Acid has eaten through from the steam that comes up. 
uh, through some of these fumaroles and so forth, and it they have to cut that part of the boardwalk off until they can fix it. So just know that going into it. So there's the boardwalk. I also want to point out the light color that you see of all of the material, the geology. It's because it's felsic. It's rhyolitic. Greetings, geologists. We are at Norris Geyser Basin in the back basin. If you're going to come out to Norris Geyser Basin in Yellowstone, as we're looking at this part of the back basin, you're going to want to notice that it's fairly barren where you see the geyser area, specifically the rhyolitic material. And the reason is because Norris Geyser Basin is so acidic that it actually can eat away like from fumaroles and mud pots and other material coming out of the ground that we can run the boardwalk. So that sometimes this area is not accessible and in the steam you see in the background in one large location, that would be steamboat in the same geyser basin that this area is back here. But you can definitely see evidence of thermal features, highly acidic ones at that. So when you visit Norris Geyser Basin, there's just so many thermal features to see. You need to recognize one of the reasons it's so rare is because of how acidic the entire section of Norris Geyser Basin is. The most famous geyser that's in Norris Geyser Basin is the least predictable, and it's called Steamboat Geyser. But when steamboat erupts, it is a big deal. It's newsworthy because this has such an unpredictable schedule. Literally, it's been just a few days up to 50 year interval between eruptions. So the last time I was there, I met a park ranger and asked him, I said, have you seen this thing go off? And he's like, oh my gosh, if you only knew. And I said, well, tell me, tell me, tell me, I want to know. <laughs> and he's like, okay. He said, so I've been working out here for the years. And he said, i been in Norris Geyser Basin. I've faithfully been waiting for my time to see Steamboat Geyser have a full eruption. The one day I get off property to go have lunch, this thing goes off. And I was like, well, when did it go off? I hadn't made it to the sign yet. I hadn't gotten on the trail. He goes, like two days ago. He said, but I could see it in the air as I was driving back. I just wasn't at the place where you can get right up to it uh, safely from the boardwalk. But when it goes off, this thing is spectacular. It can get up to 400 feet tall and last for minutes. Now, it will have this type of eruption all the time. Small little thrusts and water that come up and steam. But when it goes off for real, this is what it looks like. Again, I have not seen it go off. This is a National Park Service picture. This is my picture right here. But it's on my bucket list. I would love to see it. But this poor guy, I felt really sad for him because he had been there for so long and had missed his chance to see Steamboat in person to see it. Because again, days to up to 50 year intervals of unpredictability. So this makes it one of the most unpredictable geysers in the entire park. It is a cone geyser, so it's similar to Old Faithful in that way, but they're very different because one's predictable and one's not. When you get there, there's signage, and it will tell you when the last time it erupted, and this is what the daily eruptions look like, the little bitty ones, not the full eruption. And you can see it steams all the time. So one way you know you're coming up on Steamboat Geyser is you can just look for a big plume of steam, and you'll know you're in the right place. Another shot of that. Great look, though, at the geology. Check out that pink and tan and uh, white, very light shades of gray. Yep, that's rhyolitic felsic material, which is one reason we have just so many geysers in the Yellowstone Caldera area, which is what makes up all of these geyser basins. This is Steamboat when it's not erupting, meaning a full eruption, and the steam is constantly going. When you take a look at that one last time of Norris Geyser Basin, I want you to notice and understand that the acidity matters. It also matters for the heat because those thermophiles, bacteria mats, they're very common in Norris Geyser Basin, and certain ones of them can tolerate a certain amount of acidity and heat, so you'll see certain colors in Norris Geyser Basin 
and you'll probably see different ones in some of the others. When you get there, you can see hot springs, fumaroles, mud pots, and of course, geysers. All of them exist in Norris Geyser Basin. So let's talk about threats to Yellowstone geysers because they kind of link very importantly to Norris Geyser Basin. So in 1959, there was an earthquake in Montana that shook the heck out of Yellowstone because Montana is literally right by the Yellowstone caldera. And some of these geysers started erupting at the same time. Some of the geysers quit erupting because their plumbing got clogged or unhinged. So they became hot springs. And so something like an earthquake can change how geysers work because you need those three requirements, right? So you can end up with just two or one or none, depending on what happens to the system of groundwater the heat source, and of course, the unique plumbing. Go. Greetings geologists from Norris Geyser Basin, Yellowstone National Park Back Basin. We are at a very special geyser called Minute Geyser, and you are in for a treat. This is an extinct geyser. You're like, hmm, I'm not so sure about that. Now, it used to be much bigger, but it does have periodic eruptions like you're seeing right now. This is phenomenal to be able to see this fountain geyser be able to have any kind of eruption because it's stopped and full of coins. This is what not to do at a geyser. It's prohibited by laws. So anyway, I wanted to let you see a, a geyser that's not what it used to be. It used to be a lot bigger and it was a stop on the stagecoach route and people put their wishing well moments here. And today it can erupt like it used to, but it is erupting some. And visitors started coming here. Many were on the stagecoach route. And they would come in and they would toss t coins in here into Minute Geyser and it clogged up the plumbing. So that same park ranger I was talking about with Steamboat, I went and found him because I, I was on the boardwalk and I was doing video for this class and this thing was erupting again and it had been extinct for years. Like they didn't think it was gonna ever work again. And I don't think it's the actual original part of Minute Geyser that started erupting again. In fact, I think a new section opened up, but I went and got him. I said, you're not gonna believe this. It's erupting again. And he goes, it is not. And I said, come, come, come. You gotta see this. This is pretty awesome stuff. And he was like, I'll be darned. We got down there and he said, this is really amazing. So the next year, one of my colleagues went and he said it was still erupting. And so I, whatever reason, this thing started to be able to erupt again, which means adequate water supply, adequate heat supply, and yep, you've got it, constricted, unique plumbing that makes it work. Which brings me to why Yellowstone is such a big deal. Why is it even there? Why are the geysers in existence here in higher concentrations than anywhere else in the world? And I might point to this place right here. This is one of the most highly visited parts of the park, for sure one of the most scenic places in the park. It is referred to as Artist Point. This is a giant rhyolitic ash area, and at the very end is this remarkable waterfall. Now, you need perspective here because this thing is super deep. It's a just ginormous ravine. And you can see the river down here. Point is that Yellowstone got all this rhyolite material because there used to be super volcanoes here. And I should really requalify that. There still is a super volcano. You go, it doesn't look like any volcano I've seen exactly. Because when you get one of these types of volcanoes, the entire region blows out when it has an eruption, a big eruption, like a mega colossal eruption, which is indeed what created Yellowstone Caldera. There are three, not just one, but three different calderas throughout the Yellowstone region. The one that makes the Yellowstone Park is called the Yellowstone Caldera. There's one that is called the Island Park Caldera, and then there is one called Huckleberry Ridge Caldera. But they all started around 2.1 million years ago, which indicates that this area, as the North American plate passed over the hot spot, it created these remarkable features. So when this thing erupted, 
640,000 years ago, this is the material that got laid down. That's rhyolite, volcanic ash, volcanic top. It is the perfect stuff to make geyserite out of, which is why we have so many geysers in Yellowstone. The largest eruption occurred 2.1 million years ago. MYA means million years ago. And that was the Huckleberry Ridge. And the Huckleberry Ridge was so big that it created deposits in this area, volcanic tuff for that matter, right here. And we have ash deposits that came all the way down to the Waco area of Texas. It was huge. And so the Yellowstone caldera was smaller eruption, but it was still a mega colossal. When we get to volcanoes in our next lesson, volcanoes are rated on the Volcanic Explosivity Index, VEI Index, and eight is as high as you can get. That's a mega colossal. And it is a logarithmic scale. So it's about how much stuff comes out of the eruption and how violent it is, meaning how explosive it is. So not all eights are the same because it's open-ended. When you notice the rhyolite, this is the waterfall I was telling you about at Artist Point. You can see why people want to go visit this place, right? It's spectacular. But look at the geology and you'll notice the rhyolite is the key. And so when you get as far north as Mammoth Hot Springs, the rhyolite's not there anymore. Instead, you get the limestone that's being re-precipitated by hot springs into travertine. So see if you can guess what type of feature this says. I don't see any evidence of eruptions. It's extremely hot, so what would that be? Is it a fumarole, a mud pot, a hot spring, cone geyser, fountain geyser, slash pool geyser? So it could be a fountain or slash pool geyser, so the key is to be looking for geyserite material on the outside. I don't see that. This is a hot spring. You guessed it, this is a cone geyser. You can totally see the geyserite right in here. This is artist paint pots, and that should give you a clue. There are some hot springs there, so I'm gonna help you out with this one, but there's quite a bit of thermophiles. You see those in there, the colored stuff, and there are mud pots everywhere. So you really have to get down there and see this place to, if you're going to Norris Geyser Basin, this should be a place to go if you're an artist. People like to go there and paint. You'll usually see artists uh, set up shop and painting this area because it's aesthetically beautiful. All right, let's take a look at this. I see an eruption back here. Do you all see that? So it can't just be a hot spring. What kind of geyser would this be? A cone or a fountain geyser? Remember the difference between the two? There is no cone feature there, so it would be a fountain slash pool geyser. Ah, oh, what do you see there? I see a giant hole. This is actually sulfur caldron, a very, very acidic place. Matter of fact, the most acidic feature in the park itself. You're like, well, I thought you said Norris Geyser Basin was. It said it had the most acidic cluster of acidic uh, geysers, not mud pots. <laughs> this is the most acidic place in the park, sulfur caldron. So there's some other cool places to see when you're in Yellowstone, and this is at the northern entrance just past Mammoth Hot Springs. And the reason I show you this is most people don't make it this far. This is on the Montana side of Yellowstone. But this signage is the whole reason the National Park System was put into place, for the benefit and enjoyment of the people. To my knowledge, this is the only place in the National Park System that has the motto of the National Park System, its, its mission, in print for anyone to see. So it makes it a very cool place to stop. If you're in Yellowstone, you must go see Obsidian Cliff, which is this place right here. And you'll notice that here's the Obsidian right here. And so you're like, okay, well... Did it only have rhyolite that erupted? No, there's been other types of eruptions that were basaltic in the area. And so you're like, well, how could that be? Remember, it's all about the magma chambers. So I'll let you in on a secret. <laughs> there's two magma chambers in Yellowstone. One is much deeper than the other. That's the source that produces the mafic or basaltic type lava. But the shallower ones, the one that's 
done all of these big giant eruptions. But Obsidian Cliff is absolutely beautiful to go see. As I mentioned earlier, another really cool place to visit in Yellowstone is the most northern part of it, which is Mammoth Hot Springs. So if you're going to see that cool sign I just showed you, you've got to go explore Mammoth Hot Springs. You will not be disappointed, I promise. This is the township of Mammoth Hot Springs, and you'll notice this looks like snow. It's not. It's travertine. It has that different geology than the rest of the park. Lots of wildlife is in Mammoth Hot Springs. I would probably guess, this number is just my guess, probably around 10 to 15 percent of all visitors to the park actually make it to Mammoth Hot Springs, which is kind of sad because it's really a spectacular place to visit. When you're in Yellowstone, you can also see wildlife. And you'll notice that there's some elk. This is in West Thumb up here on the left. And then wolf sightings used to be required to be reported because of the experimental population to help rescue the wolves that were threatened under the Endangered Species Act. As we leave Yellowstone, there's a really great national park nearby, which is the Grand Teton National Park. So you're only about 60 miles south of here. You can go see one of my personal top 10 favorite national parks, which is uh, Grand Tetons. And one reason is there's moose there. And I absolutely, they're my favorite animal of all kinds. But when you go, uh, you got to get super early to see the moose in most cases. And if you're there during rutting season, which is an early fall, uh, then you might be able to see this on the side of the road. Pretty spectacular. You get to see and cross the Continental Divide if you go into this place called Grand Teton because you'll cross over that, which is the highest watershed divide, and you'll learn about that when we get into fluvial systems. And these are the Tetons back here, and I'll show you a little bit more about them in just a minute. Grand Teton National Park is in Wyoming. It is spectacular, but there are no geysers there. And it's because it's outside of the requirement, it's missing a heat source. So there may be groundwater, and there could even be potential constriction material that could form geyserite if you had the right system to make it, but there's just no heat source to make it create the volcanoes that did the same work in Yellowstone National Park. This is a beautiful national park, and it is so different from season to season, such as the autumn leaves you see right here. If you like to see, see seasonal changes of trees, this place is a gorgeous park to visit. When you get to Mammoth Hot Springs, I had to show you this because there's a herd of elk that live there. And I found it ironic the last time I was there, there was a cluster of them on the front porch of the local emergency room. <laughs> and then... Uh, most of them just gather on the lawns that you see here. They are kind of roped off from people. In other words, the park rangers keep moving the ropes or the don't cross here caution lines. Right, I'm at Mammoth Hot Springs in the town of actually Mammoth Hot Springs in Yellowstone. And we got a bunch of elk that are hanging around in the city today. And uh, interestingly enough, these guys are sitting in the shade you'll find it ironic where they're sitting. They're at the Mammoth Clinic. I don't know if they're waiting on their turn or if that's just like where their favorite place to hang out, but this is the Mammoth Clinic. And there's some back behind the building too, but they're barricaded off. You can't get any closer than this and I wouldn't want to as the herd kind of moves around. This one was right at that front door, as I was telling you, looking around, seeing where is that, what's going on? How's things going? What's up? He missed this meeting, which is basically by the town hall. And uh, this is the meeting and hanging out of the elk in Mammoth Hot Springs. He's like, where did my friends go? And here they are right here. So if you're going to visit and see one of the two most remarkable places on the planet, one Yellowstone for being where most of the geysers of the world exist, and of course the Grand Teton National Park, which is a whole nother phenomena, you need to go see these places. Go to Wyoming, check them out, allow for enough time to see both parks. You'll be learning a lot more about the Grand Teton when we get into glaciers. So I'm going to come back in just a minute and talk about wrapping this up and the key points, but let's have a nature moment first 
and then we'll come back and share the rest of what you need to know about this. That was pretty awesome, wasn't it? So yeah, it's worth going to see and you need to make a trip up here at some point in your life. This is an incredible place, Yellowstone National Park. And in all fairness, it won't be there forever. And our human existence probably will be there. But geysers are so rare. And when so many of them exist in one place in the world, it's worthy to go see them. And I'll tell you, it's just a gorgeous place to go visit. So I will see you in our next section, which will be over volcanoes. And you're in for a treat. You'll be learning about lots of things about volcanoes, probably change your whole perspective of why Yellowstone even exists. I'll see you at the next section. Bye.